Um, firstly, my name is Adrian Dodd. I'm Head of Managed Services at GSMA. Uh, thank you all very much for attending this, uh, which is the fourth in a series of showcases that we do where we highlight areas where the GSMA is helping the industry with some shared challenges um, through the delivery of some physical services. So today we're going to talk about the GSMA eSIM discovery service, what it does, how it can help you. Got a great um, lineup of speakers for you today. We're going to kick off with um, Pablo Iacopino from GSMA Intelligence, who's going to update us on the eSIM market in general. Then hand over to Chris Lee, who's going to talk about what the GSMA eSIM discovery service is itself um, and how it helps you at a very high level. Uh, then we'll move to Sylvain Givor from uh, IDEMIA to cover the critical success factors that you need to consider when deploying the service. Then going to have a, a Q&A session um, hosted again by Pablo with Marcus Kroeber from DT, Deutsche Telekom, and Mithel Tisai from Rakuten, and they're going to talk about their experiences um, with the service. And then finally round out with um, Nicolas Chalvin from Thales, uh, presenting some further details about eSIM discovery applications. And then I'll field um, questions and answers at the end. So I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. Um, there's a wealth of um, experience in the speaker panel that we've arranged for you. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, please minimize your email, um, make the most of it. And if you have any questions, put the, type them into the chat. Uh, we'll take all of the questions at the end. Uh, if we run out of time to talk to the questions. We'll write all the answers um, after the event and circulate them freely. So please you know, feel free to put as many questions in as you like. We will get to them one way or another. And then just one other bit of news before we get started. Um, obviously, GSMA has a long history of working with the SIM and we've been running the sort of physical SIM security assurance scheme, scheme SAS for many years. We recently expanded to cover eSIM security assurance, um, the ESAS scheme. And we've just had the first eSIM product um, by ST Microelectronics certified through that scheme. So that's some new news from us. And if you're interested in, in that or anything else about eSIM, please drop us a line or go to our website at uh, gsma.com slash services to find out more. Anyway, um, I think without further ado, uh, let's kick things off and turn to, to Pablo with a, a market update. So over to you, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to connect with uh, all of you. I'm Pablo Jacopino, Head of Research at GSMA Intelligence. So momentum for eSIM is accelerating around the world, both in the consumer and enterprise markets. Over the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, we will be looking at uh, some of the important trends uh, and developments that we see in the eSIM market and eSIM ecosystem. And then I will be available for questions, if any, in the last part of this webinar. Next slide, please. Let's start with eSIM in the smartphone market. There has been really good progress over the last few years. One of the things that we track at the GSMA Intelligence is the number of smartphones that have eSIM technology. At the end of 2021, that number was 57. And uh, Samsung, Apple and Google are the vendors with the highest number of eSIM smartphones. I want to call out a number of important points here. First of all, the vast majority of flagship smartphones are now eSIM enabled. So that means that eSIM is already mainstream in flagship smartphones. The other important trend is that 5G and eSIM are getting together. In fact, if we take those 57 eSIM smartphones, more than half have a 5G technology. 
There are also important developments in terms of the retail price of eSIM smartphones. Uh, some of them have a retail price below $500, which is good news uh, um, for the adoption of eSIM in the low-end and mid-end customer segments. Last but not least, there are ongoing discussions in the ecosystem about the transition to eSIM only, which in my opinion will be a game changer for eSIM adoption. Next slide, please. We also track uh, how many operators, uh, how many countries uh, have launched the commercial eSIM services. At the end of 2021, a commercial uh, eSIM service for smartphones uh, was available in uh, more than 80 countries worldwide. Back in uh, 2018, the number was 24, so there has been really good progress over the last uh, uh, couple of years. Most major markets are on board. eSIM is pretty much everywhere in Europe, everywhere in uh, North America, really good presence in Latin America, across Asia Pacific. Africa is catching up, China still missing, and in China, eSIM is available for IoT use cases, uh, for smartwatches, but not for smartphones. Timelines are still unclear when it comes to the launch of uh, eSIM service for smartphones. If we take all these countries, we can say that uh, eSIM is already reaching more than 3 billion uh, mobile subscribers. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, number of operators uh, making a commercial eSIM service available to their customers, uh, the number has been growing uh, significantly over the last few years, uh, and it was more than 230 at the end of 2021. And um, discussion with the, some of the eSIM vendors uh, indicated that this number uh, is actually even higher than 230. For some operators, uh, such as Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom, Telefonica, and many others, eSIM is a group strategy. So they are launching uh, or have already launched eSIM uh, across all their subsidiaries. And MVNOs are driving also progress in terms of eSIM for international roaming. So more than 230 operators is a big number. If we look at the future, according to our operator survey, uh, a survey of 100 operators worldwide, 88% plan to launch eSIM service by the end of next year, 98% by the end of 2025. That means that uh, um, during the rest of 2022 and 2023, there will be further momentum in terms of uh, commercial availability of eSIM services. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's been really good progress in terms of uh, um, operators, OEMs, uh, eSIM vendors uh, launching uh, eSIM technology and services. The next question is, uh, what do consumers think about eSIM? Do they know what eSIM is? We conducted a survey across eight major markets around the world. In all of these eight countries, uh, eSIM is commercially available. And we asked the consumers a number of questions. The first question was, uh, hey consumers, do you know what eSIM is? Are you aware of eSIM? And the key findings uh, were less than 30% of consumers uh, on average uh, are aware of eSIM. So still uh, low compared to awareness of other technologies such as 5G. The good news is that awareness uh, is growing. There was a five percentage point increase uh, on average uh, compared to 2020. That is a significant progress and a good factor to build on. There, are, there is no correlation with the, the availability and timelines of uh, um, eSIM uh, services. In fact, for example, in the UK, the UK was one of the first countries to launch eSIM, but correlation is still low. So no correlation with how many operators provide the service or timelines of launches. Next slide, please. The second question uh, that we asked was, OK, consumers, you say that uh, you know what eSIM is. How did you first find out about eSIM? Here, there are a couple of interesting takeaways. Number one, 28% um, of uh, people who are aware of eSIM say that uh, they know about eSIM because they read an article about eSIM. But the most important takeaway from this analysis is that there has been a slow push so far by OEMs and operators. 
So operators and OEMs don't talk much about eSIM to their customers, although OEMs do that more than slightly more than operators. Now, um, this is an important uh, point. Obviously, OEMs and operators play a key role in driving consumer awareness of eSIM and adoption of eSIM because they are the direct touch point with the consumers. Next slide, please. We also conducted an enterprise survey. Um, so moving into the uh, deployment of eSIM for IoT, um, we conducted a survey with enterprises to ask to understand the awareness of eSIM and what they think about eSIM. First of all, there is a clear takeaway here that eSIM in IoT is eSIM for digital transformation. The vast majority of enterprises are deploying IoT because these IoT deployments are part of a wider digital transformation agenda. 2% of uh, only 2% of enterprises uh, say that uh, we don't know what eSIM is. So awareness of eSIM within enterprises is very high. And 40% of the enterprises uh, say that uh, yes, eSIM, we believe eSIM is very important to achieve success in our IoT deployments. Next slide, please. And then we wanted to go deeper asking, okay, enterprise, you say that eSIM is very important for you, for your IoT deployment, why is that? And uh, the top benefits that enterprises uh, expect from eSIM are best-in-class security and scalability. Best-in-class security um, in terms of uh, connecting uh, data from the device to the cloud, from the chip to the cloud, uh, or uh, the ability to uh, connect a number of devices uh, in a very secure, secure way. So security was the top reason, the top benefit that they expect, but also the ability to update large volumes of devices quickly and remotely. And we all know that uh, large volumes of devices uh, is an important factor when it comes to IoT deployments. Next slide, please. Okay, so well, that was the end of my presentation. Uh, just a few words about what is coming next. Uh, in early July, we will release a new report looking at uh, uh, eSIM in the consumer market and providing our customers with uh, a range of data, uh, how many devices have eSIM technology, how many operators have launched eSIM and in which countries, uh, what's the consumer adoption of eSIM over the next 10 years. Uh, what could accelerate eSIM adoption? Uh, we conducted a survey with some vendors. Uh, so this report will provide uh, all our customers uh, with uh, a range of uh, eSIM market intelligence uh, and uh, insights. Next slide, please. If you want to know more about GSMA intelligence, uh, please feel free to reach out or scan the QR code that will take you to our website. And with that, I will now leave the floor to our next speaker, Chris Lee from GSMA. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, again for your great update on the ecosystem. I mean, we have some solid progress in eSIM. Now I'm going to share some updates on eSIM discovery. Next slide, please. So in case you are new to eSIM Discovery, it provides a central location to enable operator to notify the device where to retrieve the profiles. It enables automatic and streamlined user experience. Currently, we are providing the service to the industry through our four eSIM Discovery service provider, plus to 40 plus MNO accounts. On the device side, we are pleased to update that we are having um, 20 plus device brands with more than 80 separate models leveraging the service today. Then that sums up to some in interesting amounts of 18 million plus queries per month um, for the access of discovery service. Next slide, please. So let's see what are the current challenges with eSIM. So at many times, consumer thinks eSIM means QR code. Um, the consumer need to retrieve from their MNO before able to use the discovery service. While this may be okay on the early days of eSIM adoption, it shows some challenges. Um, when we expanding into like less tech savvy consumer, combining with what Pablo mentioned, like the IoT and the huge adoptions, um, that's 
large scale deployment such as enterprise on device, we will got some uh, bottleneck there. So the the need for a more streamlined and automated mechanism for profile deployment is there. Next is with the device. As we see an increasing variety of device and customer experience for eSIM devices, a lot of times the IoT device comes with different varieties of applications, which is supporting all of them is going to cost quite a bit on the customer service side. For IoT, the customer experience goes further. That at many times this device may not come with a camera and requires relies on companion application. It have uh, a lot of um, speed bumps in terms of deployment and the volume again is going to be a challenge. Next slide, please. So what eSIM Discovery is trying to help here is that we try to provide. I mean, GSMA provides a centralized location for the operator to notify the device where to download the eSIM profiles. This is achieved by using the EID, or what we call the eSIM identifier, to, down, uh, to GSMA with the profile download information. Once it is supplied to us, when the device is started or a manual interaction is triggered, then it can go to GSMA and check for the location for download and goes to the way for SMTP plus. Next slide, please. And for large scale deployment IoT, it is even more easier. When you order a bulk supply of your IoT devices, simply ask for the EID as part of your delivery. And then as an enterprise, you can simply pass this information to your operator, then all the magic happens at the same time. Next slide, please. So further supporting with Pablo's intelligence, um, we look at like where the device on and the, where the operator is coming from. So on this map, you can see that many of the countries, in particular Europe uh, and USA is already using eSIM discovery. And more interestingly, we see a growing trend for countries in the Asia Pacific, um, Japan, South Korea, and Australia is also coming online as well. Next slide, please. And on the device front, so Samsung has been, as, as mentioned by Pablo, it's been very supportive about the eSIM discovery. And also all major brands uh, like Google, Sharp, Oppo, Rakuten Mobile, um, which is joining us today as well, Sony, and more importantly on the connected workforce, which is means Windows support is also there. So device from HP, Dell, Lenovo, if it comes with a 4G or 5G modem with eSIM support, in many cases, it already support eSIM discovery. Next slide, please. So looking forward is more interesting. Um, so what the eSIM discovery currently operates now is in a pool model for the technical person, uh, which means that it retrieves the events when something happened. But in the future, with the specification update, we are seeing that the support of push notification, which just acts like you receiving an SMS today, um, that actively notify the consumer or the device holder something for their action. And the new eSIM IoT standard, which is SGP31 and 32, um, for those who are engaged in the specification, they also introduced the eSIM discovery as part of the supporting service, which helps to connect the dots. Next slide, please. So how is push notification going to change or enhance the user experience? Is that when the device turned on no longer a critical issue? When the device is turned on, they register the, the push service, and when the eSIM profile is ready, they simply get notice and notified for their eSIM profile downloads, which is way easier. Next slide, please. So onboarding, I mean, for I mean, with the crowd, we have all sorts of um, different participants of the ecosystem. So for operator, it's relatively straightforward. If you outsource your eSIM uh, system to a company, 
then you can simply tell them to onboard um, you, your, your operator to the ECM discovery service and the SMDP plus provider can do the heavy lifting for you. And for, if you are an SMDP plus operator, regardless of a pure play or operator, you can simply integrate with our service by um, testing on interface and become part of us. And OEM, we always like to support you guys more, which is easy by testing the ES11 interface, which retrieves the events from GSMA. And you can further work with us to enable the push notification for the best in class user experience. Next slide, please. So that wraps up my discussion for the day. Uh, I will pass the stage to Iremia Savin for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Sylvain Givor, and I'm the product manager of our eSIM products portfolio in academia, focusing on the consumer market. So uh, the eSIM discovery service is a great idea and a great concept. And I think Chris has just shown it uh, very well. But then, and I, I think we, we all know that in the call that bringing great ideas to life is a lot about implementation. And so that's what I would like to focus on in this section on real life implementation of the eSIM discovery service on what we've been seeing and what we've been doing on the field. So next slide, please. So the, the very first download flow that was implemented by most actors on the ecosystem, if not all actors in the ecosystem, was actually not the eSIM discovery service flow. It was the activation code with the QR code uh, approach. But very quickly, it became clear that the eSIM discovery service flow was the best approach in terms of user experience, and it's been constantly gaining traction and growing in terms of mobile operators adopting it, in terms of devices supporting it, and at the end of the day, of the day sorry, in terms of number of transactions. And that's why we, we use the word, uh, the dream in, in the title of this slide, because this is really uh, the, the best user experience that an, an MNO can give to its to its subscriber or that the end user can, can experience. It's it's the experience, a, a zero touch experience or so-called out of the box experience, also the push experience with a very simple ID. The end user has nothing else to do than to switch on its device and the eSIM download happens automatically. So uh, as written on this line and also as shown by Chris before, uh, the eSIM discovery flow is compatible with, with a number of consumer devices. But I think it's important to also highlight here the future compatibility of this flow with the industrial IoT, with the consumer IoT, and with the M2M devices in the middle to, to short term. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So what, what I'm showing on that slide, it's the architecture of the specification being discussed and being built at this very moment at the GSM. It comes from a document that's called uh, SGP.31. And okay, I, I'm not gonna explain the whole architecture, but with, what is key to note here is that you can find the SMDP plus and you can find the SMDS on that picture and they remain part of the architecture. And focusing on the SMDS, the component uh, delivering the eSIM discovery flow, what is very important to say is that the interfaces of this system towards the, the other, the, the other um, uh, elements of the ecosystem that are called, those interfaces are called ES11 and ES12, they remain exactly the same. So, well, I mean, the specification is still being discussed, but what we, we have today and what is very likely to remain is that the MNOs that invest today in an eSIM discovery server flow will be able to fully reuse that, in, that investment tomorrow in order to support the consumer IoT, the industrial IoT, or the M2M devices. Okay, so next slide, please. And now I would like to go back to the world of consumer devices and to our initial question, which was how to make sure that the implementation of the flow delivers the initial promise of this zero-touch 
out of the box, smooth and simple experience for the end user. So let's look at the process step by step. And it has six steps. If you can press for the first step, please. So the, the first step is that the customer purchases its device and subscribes to a connectivity package. So that step is really, I mean, nothing significant changes here. It's business as usual and the same sales channels as usual and the same processes for all uh, players in the ecosystem. Then as a second step, thank you. Uh, the second step is actually a key step. It's the step where the mobile operator must retrieve the identifier of the eSIM, which we call the EID. And retrieving this identifier and then passing it through the SMDP Plus is a mandatory technical prerequisite for the flow to work. So how you will retrieve this EID will vary from one sales channel to another. But you have for each and every sales channel, you have to consider very carefully that step and, and make sure you tackle it in the best possible way. If, if there is a physical interaction with a shop attendant, if it's in the shop, then the ID may be retrieved by scanning a, a barcode or a QR code. But if it's uh, an online uh, purchase, and that's also the whole idea of the eSIM to be able to promote full digital onboarding, well, then you, you, you cannot rely on this. So you, either your, your device is coming from your stock and then you have a database matching the EID of that device. So you, you, you grab it from that database. Or if the device is coming from the open market, then you may have to be requesting the end user to enter manually the EID in, in a web portal, for example. Okay, then from that step onwards and for the, all the following steps, everything is completely automatic from the end user point of view. So he has nothing to do. The operator in that third step that is shown in the slide, the operator will trigger the eSIM download on the SMTP Plus that will register a specific event for that device into the eSIM discovery server. And that's where the EID that had been retrieved in the step two is, is used to, to identify the, the device. Then in the next step, step number four, the device automatically connects to the eSIM discovery server, retrieves the event waiting for him and gets the address of the SMDP plus in that process. And in step five, the device contacts then the SMDP plus, which in the final step, step six, the device will grab the eSIM profile that is downloaded. So in one sentence, and to sum up, a very simple process with a great user experience, same step one being business as usual for all parties, step three to six being fully automated, and then a special care to be taken to see how the step two, the EID retrieval, is implemented in the smoothest way for, for each and every of your activation flows. So when you, when you do that, when you design your eSIM discovery flow and you prepare for the real-life deployment, we, we believe that there are three main aspects to look at, what we call the three key success deployment factors that we are going to present on the next slide, please. Okay, so those success factors, they're actually quite classical when designing or when changing some customer-facing process. And they are, one, a good and thorough design of the end user journey, two, the training of your staff, and three, the education of your customers. So on point one, if we go a bit deeper in each and every one of them, on the first one, when designing the end user journey, the most important is to consider each and every onboarding channel, onboarding flow separately, to really look at that critical step of retrieving the EID and to make sure to you know, carefully specify any technical change you may have to implement on your backend systems. You, you may have here to change your point of sale system or your CRM. So they ha this has to be very carefully planned in that first step. Then on the awareness and training of your staff, the focus should be put on two kinds of, of population. First of all, the shop attendants, because they are the ones that will be scanning the EID in a potential in-store onboarding process, and also on the support centers so that they are able to, to guide consumers throughout the, the procedure and handle any potential hiccups. And finally, 
Number three, especially in the perspective of a full onboarding process, it's key to have tutorials, to have infographics, to have demos or videos, plenty of material to guide your customers through each step and to consider the different experiences that they may face depending on, on their device. So if we move to the next slide, please, and we take the example of Deutsche Telekom Group, who has been a, a promoter of this technology and an early adopter of the eSIM discovery service, and with whom IDEMIA has been working on, on eSIM since the, the very beginning of that story. So Dutch Telecom is connected to the eSIM discovery server for seven countries that are listed in this slide. And DT has released this new way of downloading an eSIM in, in Germany first, and then used it to, you know, to field test and to improve the process. And DT is now releasing in, in more countries as per the list. And in the approach and in the, the implementation from Dutch Telecom, we find the, key, the three key ingredients we discussed before. So first of all, a very thorough and precise design of the end user journey for each flow involved and an adaptation of all the relevant technical systems impacted. Then as a number two, a very strong internal campaign to raise awareness and to train the, the staff. And here, I think that's a very interesting example because DT has, has created an internal brand, an internal name, which is ESIM Direct, to really directly identify this flow, make sure that everyone would be aware about it, and also to, to identify all the relevant material linked to that, slow, to that flow. Sorry. And finally, of course, when you look at the implementation done by Dutch Telecom, you, can have, you have a very complete and comprehensive material on the website to, to guide the consumer on each every, and every step of the process, and also under the, the eSIM Direct brand. So at the end of the day, if you follow those, ste those steps, what well, it works, and in the words of Marcus Klaber, one of the, one of the fathers of the eSIM discovery flow, both in Dutch Telecom and at industry level, and if we can move to the next slide, thanks. So thanks to eSIM Direct, Dutch Telecom has been able to provide a simple and frictionless out of the box user experience to its, to its subscribers. So in conclusion, we, we invite everyone in the call to consider seriously the SIM discovery server flow, to follow the example of that successful implementation, and of course, to contact IDEMIA for any question, any comment, or any, any additional information link to its deployment. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvain. So we are now ready to kick off our uh, next uh, session, which is Operators in Conversation, a short exchange of ideas. And I have the pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, two speakers. So we have uh, Marcus Krober, squad lead of uh, Smart Card Engineering at Deutsche Telekom uh, uh, Technik. Hello, Marcus. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. And then we have uh, Mithul Desai, uh, Section Manager, Product Management at Rakuten Mobile. Thanks for joining us, uh, uh, Mithul. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so over the next uh, 10 minutes, we will be hearing from uh, Deutsche Telekom and Rakuten about the eSIM Discovery Service experience, uh, and uh, we will get also some broader views around uh, uh, eSIM adoption uh, and eSIM deployment. So I will start with um, uh, you, uh, Marcus. Uh, I have a question for you. How do you see the adoption of uh, eSIM Discovery Service uh, in the consumer and enterprise market, uh, which segment is moving uh, faster? Interesting question, of course. If, if I may interpret enterprise also in the area of classical contracts, not IoT market, I think IoT is, is a different story. So if I may refer to the classical business um, of having different channels for our business, then we have the classical consumer as well as the business customers. and um, what is quite obvious is that the number of eSIMs, if we look into that only, the number of eSIMs, installed eSIMs, 
in the business segment is smaller than in the private consumer segment, but this is mainly due to the fact that the, the segment is smaller, absolutely seen, so in absolute figures. I think this is not a kind of showstopper. Um, it is quite the opposite. So what, what we have learned uh, in that area um, is that we enterprises, of course, are not to be treated as a homogeneous uh, cluster. Uh, it is mainly depending on the size. Uh, you, you, it is obvious that a company with uh, 20 employees is behaving a little bit diff different than a company with 20,000 employees. So um, there is no one size fits all. But um, generally speaking, um, after running through a kind of learning curve uh, in the in the enterprise area, um, we we have learned that. Um, there are administrators in big enterprises. Let's speak about these this segment now. There are administrators which are a kind of bookkeepers of SIM and eSIM pools and stocks. And the learning here is, which I provide, um, don't try to bypass these administrators because this will not lead to a success. Um, what we then did is um, offering uh, particular APIs where enterprise customers can deliver the EIDs, and, and I saw some notes on the chat today, and of course this is a critical success factor. How does the EID come comes into the flow? And um, um, there are different options, of course, and um, if I may refer to enterprise again, we have designed an API where um, the enterprise can deliver uh, single EIDs or also ranges of EIDs um, to us, to our CRM systems, which then are kicking off the flow um, uh, what was presented uh, previously in the previous slide here. Um, so um, takeaway might be um, it is more straightforward in the classical consumer business because we are controlling end to end the whole screens and flows. Um, but if you open up the business segment um, and you have to do something, I think this was also addressed already, it does not come for free. You have to do some changes in your infrastructure, but if you decide to do so and if you offer this to business customers, then they pick it up uh, and, and um, then they also are, of course, willing to use ESIM. Thank you, Marcus. A really important point about... Uh... The enterprise IoT market is very diverse and uh, fragmented uh, with different use cases, uh, different uh, challenges. So I agree with you, it's not one size uh, uh, fits all. So thank you, Marcus. So, um, Mithul, my question for you is, uh, how is uh, the eSIM discovery service uh, going to help uh, your customer experience, whether it's consumer or machine to machine? Um, okay, so from the uh, um, end user perspective, uh, uh, the eSIM activation through the discovery service uh, uh, is, is basically a seamless approach as it's just one click and uh, uh, it actually justifies the terminology of digital onboarding, you know, even by eliminating the uh, QR code hassles. So uh, as it's governed by GSMA, it brings in uh, more confidence for the MNO as well. Uh, in addition to this, it also gives uh, uh, you know means to reach and activate eSIM capable devices uh, more seamlessly and securely. Yeah, that's Thank how you. it is for the consumer. Okay, so going back to uh, Marcus, please. Uh, um, you touched on uh, the IoT market, enterprise IoT market. Uh, how do you see? Uh, what's your what are your thoughts about the adoption of eSIM uh, within the IoT market going forward? Um, I, I personally see very good chances um, in in having uh, SMDS also in this IoT business segment. Um, some points were already mentioned. Um, in the architecture, the SMDS is integral part um, of uh, SGP31, technically speaking. Um, so there is a standardized method for IoT devices uh, to connect to an SMDS and to get the information if a profile is waiting for this device or not. And then additionally, um, it is well suited for the segment in my eyes because, um, again, uh, um, one IoT device is not like the other, but um, uh, there, there is 
quite often no camera. There is no user in front sitting and confirming something. So we have to introduce additional components in the architecture with the remote manager. But uh, this all fits quite well together. Um, so, um, so that the SMDS is a kind of, or will be, might be uh, in future, a kind of built-in functionality um, which works out of the box quite seamlessly. And, and this is the big difference um, to one of the alternatives we have not touched today so far, which I might call the app-based uh, ESIM provisioning. So in smartphones, um, this is not a huge issue because we only have two dominating operating systems. In the IoT area, we have a fragmented technical situation concerning the OSs. And it is quite infeasible to build for any of these OSs an own app for, uh, uh, for ease in provisioning. Bigger players might afford to do so, smaller players will not. So, and this is again coming back and built in functionality which works seamlessly automated, um, and that's it. So I see a very good chance for the SMDS in the IoT market. And I would even dare to say the IoT market is waiting for such a construction and solution. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, many, many other questions to both of you, but I think we have uh, only a couple of minutes left. So my next uh, and final question uh, is for uh, Mithul. So, Going back to one of my slides, we saw that uh, um, based on our research, uh, consumer awareness of ESIM in Japan uh, has been growing faster than in uh, other large markets. And indeed, uh, Japan is the number one in terms of consumer awareness. Can you speak to this? And uh, also, how do you how do you see this uh, higher consumer awareness of ESIM uh, transforming into consumer adoption of ESIM? Sure. Uh, so, you know, as we all know that um, yeah, over the coming years, ESIM is uh, expected to achieve astonishing growth, not only on the consumer and M2M space, uh, but the same level of, uh, you know, exponential growth is expected on the IoT sector as well. Uh, said that the consumer awareness on ESIM is, is increasing here in Japan as well. Uh, your, your, uh, the survey just uh, shared by you uh, on, on the consumer awareness on eSIM uh, across multiple countries globally. Uh, it clearly shows that uh, the awareness, uh, uh, which was 22% in 2020, has now increased to 33% in, in 2021, uh, which is quite on a higher side as, as compared to other countries, uh, even like, you know, countries like Germany, Brazil, US. So it, it, it's growing on, 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 on the awareness side. Um, adding to it uh, uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, the new SGP specifications on IoT. So we had uh, defined the specification and guidelines for consumer and M2M, but, uh, you know, there was lack of standardization for the IoT use cases and device, um, as well as the deployment ecosystem around it. So with this IoT specification, uh, uh, we see it as a breakthrough uh, in standardizing the IoT deployments globally. And I am pretty much sure that this is going to be uh, the main trend in 2023. Uh, said that uh, the consumer IoT architecture, you know, uh, uh, it, it creates a huge opportunity for MNO uh, to scale up the IoT business as well. Uh, 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 as you see, you know, there, there are consumer specifications which are already uh, deployed and available. So it it, it becomes more convenient uh, for, for taking up the IoT deployments going forward. Um, said that uh, uh, just with the with the architecture specification, we would also be waiting uh, curiously on the on the technical specification as there are many uncertainties around the eSIM IoT manager. Uh, that is who will uh, um, uh, own it, whether it would be from the OEM, from the service providers, and also there are multiple integrations between the EIMs, okay, which which eventually uh, brings in more business flexibility. So considering all this factor, you know, uh, uh, the the awareness on the, on the IoT use case as well. Uh, so we we see as as a summary, if I have to say that we see that this new SGP. IoT specification will be uh, uh, and is getting uh, 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 adopted on a long term uh, to standardize all the IoT use cases as well as creating more awareness in Japan as well. 
Great, fantastic. OK, thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mithul. Thanks for joining us. Okay. And uh, I'm thank now you. leaving the floor to our uh, next uh, speaker, who is Nicolas from Thales. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, just to maybe a quick introduction, if we can move to the next slide. So uh, thanks first to the, to the to the GSME to invite uh, Thales and myself to speak today and to be with you uh, this afternoon. So I'm uh, Nicolas Chalva, I'm uh, responsible for the marketing uh, within Thales, uh, taking care of the uh, eSIM discovery and other services for the eSIM, such as the DP Plus or uh, OSM on demand subscription management. If we move on the next slide and uh, to summarize and uh, what has been already mentioned by Pablo and also uh, by Marcus. Uh, today, uh, the eSIM market is quite large and can address a lot of different uh, devices, from the consumer to the IoT and to the machine to machine. And uh, for the time being, the, uh, the eSIM discovery is covering mainly the consumer part of uh, all the devices uh, uh, equipped with, uh, with an eSIM. Uh, now, as already uh, mentioned, we know that the GSMA is working on a new specification targeting uh, the IoT. So uh, this specification is called WG7 or SGP31. And uh, as you know, uh, this uh, new specification for IoT will also uh, define the SMDS uh, or the eSIM discovery service as a standard method to uh, to upload the eSIM profile into the, uh, the IoT devices. So uh, if we move on the next slide, uh, saying this, uh, we know that it will enlarge the capacity of the targeted devices for this uh, uh, solution from the GSMA. And as already mentioned uh, by, uh, by Marcus, that this solution is really uh, a key for the market and the IoT ecosystem is waiting for this solution to be able to provide this out of the box experience to the IoT uh, devices that do not have any screen display keyboard or whatever. So it's, it's a huge uh, evolution of the specification to also cover this uh, uh, SMDS or eSIM discovery services in this new IoT specification. Now, uh, if we move on the, uh, the next slide, uh, what is important is to see what will be tomorrow the volume of possible uh, uh, transaction supported or that the uh, eSIM discovery service will have to support. So again, here we have put one figure, so uh, uh, more or less 900 million devices uh, uh, that could be supported by, uh, by the, the, the GSMA services. Again, here we have the taken the global market, consumer IoT, and also part of the machine to machine that as you may know, for machine to machine, uh, the ecosystem is also uh, uh, looking after this, uh, this new specification to see how they can benefit of this, uh, this uh, WG7 specification also for the machine to machine. So having in mind this, uh, this uh, important and huge figure, so if we go to the, the, the next slide, the key question we have is really uh, what do we need uh, to do with the eSIM discovery server to be able and to be sure that will uh, support this huge increase of transaction on the server, on the services. So if we move on the, uh, on the next slide, the, the first key step for these uh, services is to move on cloud, public cloud infrastructure. So uh, moving on cloud, in fact, we are going to, to, to bring scalability. So as you know, scalability is very important to be able to absorb all the massive future traffic uh, for, for the services. And uh, cloud service providers such as Google, for example, offer this ability to increase capacity and adapt uh, the capacity to the services provided by the GSMA. So this is what we, we call also elasticity. So it's key uh, for the services, having in mind the huge amount of transaction we target to do. The second point in uh, uh, brought bring by the, 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 the cloud uh, deployment, the public cloud deployment is reliability. Of course, what we need, because this is a mission critical services for you telecom operators and for the service provider to get the, the, the connectivity and the cellular connectivity, we need a reliable services. And this is what we can bring with such a, a cloud, public cloud uh, infrastructure as we know that, of course, the provider will have several network uh, servers, will have a, a huge bandwidth, will have a dedicated IT resources, and also uh, uh, combined with the, 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 I would say, the experience from Thales, 
we will be able to ensure this uh, reliable service from the GSMA. And again, it's very important because it's a real mission critical services for you telecom operators. The third point is future proof. Again, uh, being in a, a cloud environment, it's very important because it's really the way for you to benefit uh, all the time of the latest implementation uh, and get the latest services features from the GSMA. We'll come back on the, the, next, fe the, the, the next feature the GSMA plan to de uh, develop, deploy, as already uh, explained by Chris. So very important. And of course, all of this is uh, done in a secure way, uh, mainly based on HSM uh, implementation. So if we move on the next slide, uh, the second key point uh, to ensure uh, the, uh, the, I will say, the service to support all these uh, uh, transactions, uh, it's to implement the push notification. So it has been uh, mentioned by Chris as a, an evolution of this uh, this uh, eSIM discovery service, and it's very important because again, if we we have uh, uh, we go to the next point, is uh, to bring a better efficiency. Again, as quickly explained by Chris, instead of uh, to have the devices uh, generating millions of, of requests to the, the server, now the device will be informed, notified uh, about the fact that uh, he has a NISIM profile to be downloaded. So again, we will, of course, uh, reduce the, 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 uh, the un unnecessary request and of course, improving uh, all the resources usage of the services and uh, doing so, we will have a better service, of course, but it will also contribute with a, with a key topic we all have today is about the, uh, the sustainability and the, the, the impact on, on the environment. The second point about the push notification is to also improve the, uh, the, the efficiency of the solution now, uh, I, being sure that each time a profile is available for a device, it will be downloaded immediately. Of course, uh, for the time being, now the device has to trigger uh, the server to check uh, if a, a profile is available or not. Now, automatically, the device will know that the profile is available. So it's very important for some use case, especially uh, when you are in a shop and you have uh, uh, people that uh, want to access to, to the subscription, that it's done automatically, not to wait for the device to check if a profile is available or not. If we go on the, the, the next slide, so uh, the point has been mentioned about EID. We know that uh, to be able to to, uh, to do the service, the eSIM discovery service, uh, the, the operators has to provide the EID, which is the eSIM uh, identification uh, of the device. And it's not so easy. I have seen uh, all the, 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 the comments in the, in the chat. So uh, you are looking for a solution which is more efficient, uh, more easy for the end user, how we can improve the end user journey. So this is a discussion we, we, have, we have currently uh, in the, the, the next uh, specification provided by the GSMA, the V3.0 specification. So again, it will improve as, uh, for example, for a device with a screen, it will be mandatory. Uh, for the device to display or to access uh, to the EID in, a, in an easy way. Uh, what will be also recommended uh, by the specification is for a device, uh, or at least for IoT device without any screen display and so on, to print this information on the back of the device. And uh, as mentioned by Chris, in case of a, a bulk of devices, uh, the, the service provider or the device maker will be able to provide a complete list of the devices to the operators to put it in one way uh, in the services. Again, uh, it's a, a first step to improve this, as we know that EID is a very important point, at least in the end user journey for you, uh, telecom uh, operators. Again, this is what is currently discussed uh, at the GSMA specification. As the specification has not yet been improved, it can already change. So if we move on the, the next slide, so we have seen that uh, at least to be able to uh, to uh, anticipate the huge volume of transaction on the eSIM discovery service, uh, three main uh, evolution with the uh, public cloud uh, migration, with the, the uh, uh, notification, but also to improve the AD access. Of course, the goal is always to, uh, to improve the, the services, uh, to make it more intuitive and out of the box experience for, for the end user. And especially as mentioned by Marcus, it, it will be key for the IoT devices without any interaction 
interface and uh, with a very limited capability, not to say no capability to have an application on it, a carrier app application on it, to make it uh, universal and standardized uh, using a GSMA specification, and it has been mentioned by one of you in the chat, is also uh, a way to have something which is interoperable and easy way to integrate new uh, devices and to do interconnection between uh, the, the service, the servers and the devices. Of course, already mentioned, it's very key for the IoT devices, again, out of the box uh, experience. And of course, it's a, a key contributor for uh, the, the main uh, mega trend for, uh, for the ecosystem regarding digitalization. As again, it's a way for the end user uh, on uh, consumer devices, but also for the IoT uh, tomorrow, a way to digitalize all the, uh, the, the end user journey. So thanks a lot. Uh, now we are entering in the Q&A uh, part. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola, and all the other speakers. OK, so we've got a few minutes. I'll do some uh, questions. And maybe I could offer the first two briefly to Pablo. So I have a question. Uh, when, and these are difficult questions, when do you think manufacturers will shift to eSIM only? And then when do you think eSIM e adoption will start to increase in Africa? Yes, very difficult questions, uh, but at the same time, very important questions. So, so on question one, uh, uh, timelines for uh, uh, eSIM only smartphones. Uh, my my view is that it will happen. It will be a gradual transition, uh, and it will happen between 2022 and 2024. And this is also confirmed by the survey that we did with the SIM vendors. Uh, uh, there is a consensus that one device maker will launch eSIM only in 2022 and more than half of the vendors by 2024. On the second question about Africa, um, I think it will take a few years. Africa will have the slowest adoption of um, uh, eSIM, uh, also because uh, the eSIM at the moment is uh, mostly present in uh, flagship smartphones. So affordability is a barrier at the moment in Africa. It will take time, but Africa will get there as well. Okay. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, next couple of questions for Chris, I think. Um, we've got a question about how we achieve 18 million monthly queries without Apple iOS devices being in the equation. And what about that, given that it's not a GSMA server? Um, so two questions there, but I'll remind you we're, we're under NDA. So uh, Chris. So I, I think the key point to take here is that GSMA is offering an industry standard eSIM discovery service opening for all OEMs. I mean, OEMs may have their own decision from time to time, but anyway, I will put it as that. Um, and then with 18 million, you will be surprised actually how many devices are on the ground already with eSIM. So as I mentioned, like it actually goes back to somewhere like 2020 or 2019 that eSIM discovery capable device is already start deploying. And of course, OS upgrade keeps going on and that number is going to go in increase. Okay. Anyway, I, I think we should watch this space. Um, right, the next, uh, thank you, Chris. The next one is, is eSIM discovery service open to private networks? Uh, I think that also better get go to you, Chris. So I think it also depends on um, which SMDP plus operator they buy um, to work on their private network device. I mean, in theory, it all works uh, the same way. I mean, uh, if, uh, our our team from Edemia or Thales can fit in a little bit more, but we we have an industry solution. The eSIM discovery service works when um, when you have an internet connection, and that's it. Yeah, and I think our general policy is we wouldn't want to turn anyone away. Okay, and then uh, there was. Um, several comments on the EID challenge and the, the length of the digits and um, Nicola already commented a little bit. I wonder if Nicola you'd like to comment further or then uh, Sylvain? Mm, yes, as already mentioned, this is discussion we have and uh, we can see it in the in the chat uh, in the current specification, the V3.0, which is still under definition and should be approved soon. 
Now we need, of course, maybe uh, to discuss uh, even more with uh, the people deploying the solution to see how we can improve it again. But it's a real good first step, at least uh, on what is defined in this specification. Sylvain, anything to add? No, I think I, I think it's it's great, and I, I think it is indeed a, a key question. So I think people in the chat uh, really really got uh, what is a, a key element of of a good uh, implementation and what, where to focus on. And and indeed, I, I mean, I, I would agree with the overall message from Nicola. A first step coming uh, on on phase three, but it's not the end of the story. And we are we are always looking at ways to improve the, the end user journey, which is instrumental in that uh, in that industry. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll offer the, the next question to you, you both again. So what does uh, what if an MNO wants to test the eSIM discovery service? So first Sylvain and then um, Nicola. Yeah, I mean the, the connection with the discovery flow is done through the SMDP plus. So through the to, through the service we are providing, and we are already connected both on test and production systems. So I think the, the answer was kind of already given in the chat, but that's the right answer. I mean, contact us, and we will be helping you throughout the whole process from the technical, but also the commercial and the contractual part. It's very business as usual. It's quite easy and it's been in the in the market for a while so and and i and i think we are we are a, a very good contact point to, to start with okay nicola yes just to add that uh, this uh, part of the gsm offer we have a three months uh, offer that can be used by the uh, the operators to test the solution as i mentioned by sylvain of course you have to to contact uh, your uh, dp plus provider on the uh, eSIM discovery service uh, sellers so please contact of course Thales, uh as we maybe provide you the dp plus okay now i think we're just over time so i'm going to draw it to a close there thank you so much to all the speakers um pablo chris sylvain Marcus, Mithil, and Nicola. Um, we will we'll, uh, provide any further questions, uh, answers to those offline that we didn't take, and the slides will be available. We will send you notifications, but I hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you very much, and good luck with your eSIM uh, implementations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.